say if you're talking to friends and they're like, I want to get for coding a drive, what would you tell them to do to get started? I mean, I still think HTML and CSS is the best gateway drug. Because it, it's just so accessible. It runs in the browser. You can build something on your desktop in a notepad app and save it as an HTML file and then right click it and open it in Chrome. And you've just done something. Um, and so, I, you know, it's like every discipline has this problem. Uh, in skateboarding, the bar now, the minimum bar used to be like if, if you could carve down the street and then it became you have to learn an ollie, which is an incredibly actually difficult move. And then you have to learn a kickflip. Like ollies and kickflips are, are now not even like those are just base level. But it used to be the pros couldn't even do those. Wow. And you see this in you see this in any discipline, right? Like eventually the baseline just gets higher and higher and higher. And I think the danger there is that today's pros, like the, the, the pro level developers, probably got started in hypercard. Adobe Flash, HTML and CSS, like super basic stuff. And they gradually, over decades, were able to like, you know, increase what they were doing and get to where they're at now. But now we expect complete beginners to just jump in on the deep, in the deep end and like just figure it out. It's like, uh, I think it's okay to like start with HTML, CSS and have fun building something on the web and uh, making it appear on a web page. And then sign up for a Netlify account and drag it into your, like drag that folder over to your Netlify account and all of a sudden it's a website, you know? Like yeah. that to me is the joy of, it's like podcasting. Like podcasting gets fun once you've published your first episode and it's on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and you can share it, you know? I think beginners need to have more moments like that. Maybe you're someone like me and you just, it's gotta be social. You gotta get together at a cafe with some other people and work on it uh, collaboratively or get on a uh, screen share and do it remotely. Um, you know, you gotta figure out how to make it fun and kind of engaging for you. And um, that's what's tricky about it is that up till now we've assumed <laughs> that the way every neck beard learned is the way we've got to learn. And it's just, you know, nothing wrong with neck beards, but they learn a different way than the, the rest of us. And it's okay. This is actually the, going back to skateboarding, this is what's been so fascinating. So skateboarding kind of builds up, up and up and up into the uh, now street skateboarding, which is what most people kind of recognize is at its apex but it almost killed the skateboard industry because it was, it was very elitist. It was very narrowly defined. Um, it was not open to, to newcomers. It was not fun for newcomers because you go to the skate park and uh, you're, you're trying to learn the basics and you know, you got people yelling at you to get out of the way and other things, right? It almost killed the skateboard industry. They were so obsessed with the elitism and the way it had always been and kind of this, and programming has this too, this like sneering, I don't know, pride or, or insular nature of it, you know, like to outsiders, it's like, you know, exactly what you said, like, oh, that's the way you, you know, that's the way you don't use Vim or you don't know how to quit out of Vim. And like, there's all these like, yeah. Nobody new wants to go into that. You don't want to feel like an idiot. What saved skateboarding is uh, there are a ton of female skateboarders that are starting. And they brought a totally different tone to the, the industry. Hmm. They were just all about having fun. I... They didn't care if they were learning like the craziest tricks. They didn't care if uh, they, you know, they didn't care if they looked dumb because they, they would show up as a group 
socially, and they are just about having fun. They're not trying to put on appearances. They're not trying to be something that they're not. They're okay to encourage each other and cheer each other on. Transform the skateboard industry. Female skateboarders are uh, buying more skateboards now than almost any other group. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're like economically, they're a huge driver in the industry. I'm kind of curious about this. I didn't think I'd be talking about this in a coding podcast, but like, <laughs> I feel, I feel really old now. Cause every time I walk around my city, I see girls carrying skateboards and I'm like, in my mm -hmm. day, I mean, not disapproving, but in like, in my day, there weren't any girls doing skateboarding. It was like unheard of. Yeah. You wouldn't see a single. And you could see why. Yeah. You yeah. could see why, because it was. It was awful. Yeah, no, no, that, it, it like, makes sense. Yeah, you would you would get made fun of, or you would get harassed. Yeah, um, but it's, it's and great so that it's more. Open well, it's now. great, and it's a great example for you know how the old guard and elitism and all you know all of this protectionism that can enter into any sort of discipline can be really toxic and can ultimately kill that discipline if you're not careful. And so that, I think, needs to get brought into programming. Cool. Um, well, we've got, and, like, I think we've got the episode title of what coding and skateboarding have in common. He's not going to click yes. that. <laughs> it's a good parallel, I think. Uh, because the other thing girls uh, taught the industry is that you could learn differently. You know, it that... The way a lot of guys would learn to skateboard is they go into their garage by themselves and they would just practice for hours. Ollie, 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 Ollie. And then they would go out to their friends. They would only skateboard when the, with their friends once they had mastered that move into the garage. Kick flip, kick flip, kick flip, kick flip until you get it. Uh, but not everybody learns that way. Yeah, it's a really and, good point. Uh, All about the ego protection. And, yeah. yeah. And, and now, again, so now, even if you go to skate parks now, uh, the tone has changed. You know, it's just more fun. It's more free. It's okay to fail. You know, if there's other people in there trying things out and failing and not getting it right, you, you feel more freedom to do that yourself. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's lots of opportunity for that to happen in programming. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So I guess you're already had like loads of experience as a marketer. Lots of people in this situation kind of stay in their lane. They're like, I'm going to be great marketing. You're going to be handling the coding. <laughs> this is kind of a devil's advocate thing to stay on the coding podcast. But why the hell sure. did you learn coding when you already know marketing? Yeah, I mean, the, the answer is a little bit more nuanced than that because I don't think people are that one dimensional. So there's like this trend to say, like you go to a meetup and you, you always want to have your line like, oh, I'm a designer. Oh, I'm a developer. Oh, I'm a marketer. Oh, I do product marketing. I do project management. And I, I think most folks are much more multi-dimensional than that one liner. Uh, I got the hang of HTML pretty quick, but uh, other types of programming, always tried it and it never really stuck. But that doesn't mean that, you know, there was always some coding going on throughout the years, maybe with some scripting languages, maybe picking up a bit of JavaScript here to accomplish a task, maybe doing a little bit of coding in PHP when I was building WordPress sites for other people. So, yeah, it, there's just kind of layers of experience that led me to where I'm at now. And, you know, in the kind of the most recent stretch, I started to get to know these folks in the Laravel community, which is a PHP programming framework. And I just got inspired being around them to start to learn more coding, to force myself to learn more coding. So my approach was I said, I'm going to just go live and I have enough of an audience that people would show up and a lot of my audience is software developers and so <laughs> they were happy to help me whenever I went live and it was you know really uh, fun it was fun to be like working on something to have a destination and have just 
a span of you know three to four hours where I could go, okay, I'm just gonna do this today and kind of crowdsource my education. And I think the other thing I realized is that you know a lot of developers can learn by themselves in a room with a book even and just you know figure stuff out. But I'm much more social and having that social element, having people alongside really helps me. Even if it's, it doesn't have to be live, like public, it can be, you know, I've hired junior developers in the past, even when I'm like more skilled than them, I've hired them just to kind of be there with me socially so that we can pair program together and figure out something. And I might be doing most of the heavy lifting, even in terms of like, okay, well, let's research over here and let's pull in my friend Adam here to see what he says. And, but it's just having that other person there with me socially really inspires me and makes it fun for me. So yeah, that, that insight kind of unlocked it for me because I tried, again, since I was a little kid to, to get into programming and to do it at a, a meaningful way. And I've probably got the skill level of a, a pretty good junior developer and maybe that's all I, I'm ever going to need. Yeah, for me, that was the fun part. It's like, okay, I'm going to figure this out and, and learn something, add a new bunch of skills to my tool belt. And ultimately, I think it makes me a better co-founder. It makes me a better product marketer. It kind of unlocks a bunch of potential. Nice one. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. I have to admire you for kind of jumping into the deep end and learning to code because I guess you're doing these kind of live streams. So was yeah. the part of you where you kind of just like, okay, my audience are going to be nice. Or is there a part of you that can be like, ah, you don't know how to write for loop or like, oh my God, what an yeah. idiot. Why? Because it's quite a brave thing to do. Well, well, I mean, in some ways I purposely kind of presented myself as the village idiot because for one, it just made it easier to, for my own ego, like, okay, let's just, I pretend I know nothing, like I am clueless. And that will, you know, make it easier if I mess up on something that might have previously hurt my self-esteem. People just assume I know nothing. It, it kind of makes it easier for them. Maybe they'll be more likely to help and more patient. Uh, and for me, it'll help with my ego. Uh, but the truth is, I mean, I had an underlying knowledge built over, you know, I've been Again, using computers for a long time, if you're going to put anything out publicly, you've got to figure out your ego and self-esteem and how much is on the line. And being appropriately vulnerable has helped me. So yeah. Being able to reveal like, you know what? I need help. Like, I, I don't understand a lot of this stuff. And I'm kind of embarrassed about it. I've, I've been you know, passionate about the internet and computers for so long. And it's just embarrassing that I don't know more about this. And putting that all out there up front, just, it was like a relief for me. It was just like, ah, okay, well now I could, I've got nothing to hide. I can just be myself yeah. and go for it. I like that. And to be honest, I'm trying to do that whenever I can of just keeping this kind of curious, mind being I might not know the best way to do things and still doesn't know most keyboard shortcuts you know like mm. all these like things that you know I could be ashamed about but I'm just fine to uh, put it out there and laugh about it I think that was the other kind of key I was okay with laughing about it uh, and the other advantage is <laughs> I built these relationships with people that were willing to be patient with me like if you watch some of those tutorials, <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, and I don't even, I didn't even realize how well regarded some of these friends I had were in the programming community. To me, they're just people I chat with. And so, uh, you know, people thought it was hilarious that I was getting help from some of these folks and just, uh, and asking them the dumbest questions and painfully, you know, moving my mouse around and not knowing keyboard shortcuts and not knowing how to yeah. do certain things and using the 
you know, the GitHub GUI instead of the command line. Like, I, it must have been painful for them, but there was enough of a friendship there that I was able to get away with it. And for, I think, a lot of other people who are new, it was, it was cathartic because they're just seeing me, like, stumble through all this stuff and being honest about it. Like, okay, like, what is this about? Let me ask you about this. Let me ask you this question that I think a lot of people think about but don't articulate. And uh, revealing those things, bringing those things out to the open is helpful for me and I think helpful for other people. Yeah, that's really cool. And yeah, I totally get the it's very smart to kind of present yourself as the, oh, I'm a dumb programmer or blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And it kind of like takes the wind out of their joke. Or whatever. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. If I'm hanging out with friends and this is random, but I might make a joke about me being bold because then, if, yeah. then someone's like, if they try and make a joke about it, it's like, I just made a joke about that. So it's like, yeah, it takes the air out. Yeah. So if someone calls you yeah. a dumbass for some coding problem, if you've titled the video, I'm a dumbass, then it's like, <laughs> yeah, you can't, they can't really get you <laughs> on that. So. That's right. That's right. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a disarming mechanism and probably honestly just helpful in general. It's, I don't know what, what do you call that? What do you call those folks? Um, the uh, ego is the enemy. Uh, stoics. Stoics, yeah. So yeah. Sto this is a stoic thing is that you go to the kind of the extreme bad and you just imagine it or present it and then you kind of disarm all of the power it has over you. So what's, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Some, somebody, some stranger on the internet with no avatar is going to call me an idiot? Like, yeah, I can laugh about that already. Like, yeah. it's just, it, to me, it doesn't matter. And, you know, the emotional weight that you put on these things up front, like, so much of life is just internal and mental. And so you're, you're, your disposition towards those things. If if your if your entire emotional health is running on nobody criticizing you or not making mistakes or not appearing foolish, uh, it's just going to be difficult to make progress, right? Yeah. But definitely. as soon as you can kind of subvert that and say, you know what, like I'm going to subvert that, and now it's not going to be have any power over me because now it's just light it's it's okay to joke about it it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to appear foolish i don't care if i appear foolish uh, because i'm curious and i'm going to find the answers and you know i know what i want to get out of this and uh, i know also what i want how i want to help other people i was kind of wondering to get onto the kind of business side of things I know that hmm. obviously you've grown Transistor to over $1 million annual recurring revenue. And mm -hmm. like that's obviously like podcast hosting is a really big market. And I know you've spoken mm -hmm. about it before, but can you explain the whole thing about going after a big market versus say a smaller market for if you're like a bootstrap founder with no kind of VC backing or mom and dad backing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... I think the, the important lesson there is there has to be some sort of momentum in the market. There has to be some sort of pull that already exists, especially if you're independent. If you have millions of dollars in venture capital, you can afford to experiment. You can afford to try to uh, you know, break ground where no one's done it before. But if you're an independent, you don't have that luxury. If you're an independent, you really need to observe what is already in motion and just focus on that. I have a few metaphors I've used here. One is surfing. You know, a, a surfer learns to recognize the size and shape of good waves. And all of the energy is in the wave. The surfer doesn't create the wave. They just ride them. And it's their job to learn to recognize a good wave and then have the kind of base fundamentals that will allow them to paddle out and catch that wave. And that's very much like a founder or entrepreneur. You're 
the surfer, you're paddling out, and you're hoping to catch a good wave. And you're hoping to catch a wave that is appropriately sized, that has the enough energy to take you where you want to go. So, you know, podcasting is actually not a massive wave. It's grown pretty slowly. It's, it's over a decade old. and grows like 10% a year on average, maybe. Not the hockey stick that is, you know, definitely like compared to things like TikTok. TikTok mm. um, in a few short months grew way faster than podcasting. Uh, there's, I think they say like 1.5 million, maybe 2 million podcasts now. Um, it's still small. There's like something like, I don't know, 700 million blogs. Uh, there's 36 million or 50 million YouTube channels with more than 10 subscribers. So that it, it is, podcasting is small compared to those, but it's big enough for John and I, my co-founder, to get what we want. We like the customers. We like the category. We like audio. We like slow, mindful technology. We like um, the open protocol of RSS. We even like the mess of it because it's incredibly messy. It's not like YouTube where there's one platform that owns the whole category. Um, you know, there's Spotify and Apple and Google and Amazon all battling it out. And we like it. We think that's great, even though it causes us all sorts of headaches and we have to, we do like 75% of our customer support is uh, for Apple and Spotify. Um, so it's a good fit in that sense. And there was momentum when we decided to paddle out and catch the wave. And ultimately, you don't know until you've paddled out and you're riding the wave how good it actually is. But there's a lot of that work you can do beforehand. And you don't get good at recognizing waves by surfing in a pond. You don't get good at recognizing good waves by staying home every day and playing Xbox. It really requires you to show up every day at the beach, work on your fundamentals, be in the water, try a few waves, be in motion, you know, and eventually, as the metaphor goes, you might find that wave that's just great for you and is worth paddling out for and trying to ride. So yeah, I, I think that kind of encapsulates the, the thinking. You, you don't want to go after something. I think beforehand you, you mentioned this, like that just you and 20 of your friends might like. That's not enough. You know, even with my audience, when we launched Transistor, at the time maybe I had like 20,000 Twitter followers. Not a massive audience, but enough. You know, that was maybe our first 200 customers. Maybe our first 500. And then we did our launch on Product Hunt, and I have a pretty good following on there too, and you know, that was maybe our next 200 or 400 customers. But that's not enough. You know, we have over 5,000 customers now. To get to that number, we had to be riding a wave that was more than just our audience, our connections, our little corner of the world. And that includes for most people, like, in the indie hacker community, that's going to mean it has to extend beyond uh, indie hackers. Indie hackers can't be your only customer base because it's relatively small. They're not great customers. They don't last very long. They don't. Uh, they don't last. You know, there's. They don't last long in the sense that it depends on what you're doing. But as a customer, like Transistor, at the beginning, we were the cheapest customer. Like okay. we used uh, Z Zoho for email. Uh, instead of Google Apps, because we didn't want to spend any money on yeah. email. Yeah, okay, yeah, we, yeah. We, uh, you know, it, it's just not a great customer uh, to have. And even today at, you know, where we're at revenue-wise, just when you're a small company and there's just, you know, there's, uh, there's three of us full-time now, it's still like everything you want to add just feels like, ah, oh, do we need that? Yeah. It's, I've, uh... it's not like we're spending money freely you know i know the feeling and like i know i have spoken about this with other bootstrap founders where they're just like people will really be like oh do I, can i should i really spend like 10 bucks on this thing and yeah mm -hmm. that's not a good customer to have because 
Um, yeah, bootstrappers, I guess, by their nature, are pretty cheap, especially if someone's like, you know, maybe quit their job or even mm -hmm. just like, oh, I've got six months to make this work. They're not going to be mm -hmm. yeah, lavish with their expenses. That's right. Now, it could be a part of a big, I mean, we have, uh, Transistor has mm, a lot of software developers that use us for their podcast. It's a great niche, like, awesome. But we're stacking niches. We are, sure, software developers, yeah, we, we love serving software developers. We want to have as many of them as customers as we can. Uh, programming podcasts are popular. Uh, you know, come on over. We want doors wide open. Uh, bootstrap. We have a lot of bootstrap podcasts on Transistor. A lot of folks um, who use it for their like daily, uh, for their weekly uh, call with a buddy who's also bootstrapping. Like, I love that format of show. We'll take all of them. I, I would love to have, you know, that whole niche on Transistor. Uh, but those, even those two alone are not enough. We, you need more. Uh, creators, creator economy people. That's another great use. Uh, the, the make money online crowd, the, uh, the people that want to have podcasts about the movies they like, like these are all niches and we could have built a podcast hosting platform for people who like making podcasts about the movies they like, uh, but that's not enough. Yeah. And I think sometimes people think like any, any niche will do, like I just have to choose a niche and then it's easy to target them and therefore easy to create a business. And I don't think that's true. Uh, sometimes you need to focus on an initial use case to get traction. And, you know, if it works, if that helps you get traction, then that's great. That, that's not a bad strategy. But, you know, when Transistor started, we thought we're only going to be podcast hosting for businesses and brands. And I got a DM from Ali Abdal. Uh, pretty famous YouTuber, and he said, uh, I signed up, but your messaging totally, like, it almost made me not sign up. And then I got into the product, and, I said, and he realized there's nothing here that wouldn't be for YouTubers like me. So why are you excluding me with your messaging? I said, yeah, that's a good point. And so we, we changed the messaging, and in our case, this is, I think the other, fo the focus on niches also ignores how people actually search for products and buy them. In a niche, in a, in a category like podcasting, which is still not that big, the way people find podcast hosting is they might start with a Google search that goes, how to create a podcast. So it's not the niche you're trying to target, it's what they're trying to accomplish. What are they searching for? What are they trying to find an answer to? That's what's important. And you can distract yourself by saying, no, 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 this is podcast hosting for businesses, where it really, if all you just focused on was podcast hosting or best podcast hosting or uh, best podcast hosting site, or how do I upload my podcast to Apple, those are better uses of your time, right? Cool. And so instead of, <laughs> you know, instead of whatever, like I'm, I'm building something for, you know, indie hackers, it's like, okay, well, I, I'm an indie hacker, but I rarely search for uh, blank for indie hackers in Google. Mm, like, I don't care. It's, it's not an important filter for me, yeah. you know? It's not like I, when I'm searching for, uh, I don't know, uh, video editing software. I'm not looking for video editing for indie hackers. Yeah. I'm not looking for live streaming software for indie hackers. It doesn't matter. I'm just looking for the best live streaming software. So, and that's what you want to focus on if you're building it, right? No, that's a really cool point. So I take it with all these things, how does someone like yourself go after, I don't know, like, like keywords, like best podcast hosting? Because I guess the thing is, if you are going for a bigger market, let's say not a niche, I mean, mm -hmm. you're going to have to, your rivals, I guess, are like Anchor or like, you know, yeah. or if like, you yeah, ConvertKit's rivals were like Mailchimp. How do you go after yeah. the, the the huge companies? Well, first of all, what's amazing is that a tiny uh, company like Transistor, like I said, three full time people now. It was two full time people until a month ago. 
that we can compete. Yeah. Like that alone is, is fascinating. There's this tiny per, two person company and somehow I was on a call with a, a big company, like massive, one of the top 10 biggest companies in the world. And they're looking for a podcast hosting provider. And he's like on the call and he's like, okay, he's with head office in purchasing. He's like, okay, after we this call, I need to get your purchasing department on the phone. Then I'll talk to your legal department and then we'll get our engineers to talk to each other. And then I've got an integration specialist. And I was like, hold up. I said, this is a two person company. And he was like, what? I said, yeah, it's just two people running this thing. And if you need all that, I can tell you right away. We're not a good fit for you. And he's like, I don't understand. You, you folks show up consistently as one of the top five podcast hosting sites. I said, yeah, this is the beauty of the internet is that an independent has enough leverage that they can get noticed by massive multinational companies, that they can compete against companies with trillion dollar market cap and do fine. So um, it is possible. And, you know, there's a bunch of ways that independents can gain leverage. I mean, one thing is just that if it's about content and it's about search and it's about being helpful and it's about understanding, you know, how search algorithms work and I mean, everybody can play that game. Hmm. And as long as you're consistently showing up in a way that is consistently helpful and, you know, it, as long as you're doing that, um, I, mean, I think the other thing is that I think people who give too much uh, credit to these big companies, like they're slow. They're full of mediocre people. They're full of people who don't like their jobs. They're full of, of people who are not well incentivized. And uh, I kind of like it. I just like this idea of showing up every day and going, okay, how can I compete against these people? Mm. And uh, so we've competed against them by... Uh, leveraging affiliates. So we share 25% of revenue with people who bring us customers. Um, and a lot of those people are really good at SEO. They're independent business people too. They're indie hackers as well who have built these, these sites that are uh, kind of like, um, you know, uh, the authority on podcasting in general or the authority on the creator economy in general. And so, you know, they put lots and lots of work into it, but they're little one to five people shops that are doing the same thing we're doing. And so we've just shared the upside with them. Yeah. So if you bring us customers, we'll give you 25% of revenue, um, which at the time felt like a lot, but in retrospect has been really helpful. Yeah. One thing that swung it for me was like big fan of the Indie Hackers podcast. And yeah. So, and Coral and Alan, it's like, oh, what does what does Indie Hackers use for podcast hosting? Oh, they use Transistor. Yeah. All right, cool. And I bet you get a bunch of people from that who are like, okay, well, if it's good enough for like Indie Hackers, which is owned by Stripe, and Cortland yeah. presumably has a, a like whatever budget for hosting. Mm -hmm. It's like, cool. Well, if he uses it and he runs a great podcast, then yeah, that's going to attract other people. That's right. Yeah, social proof is another lever that you can you can pull. Building relationships, having a network, the people you know and the people who know you, uh, all of that is helpful. Having decades on the internet and decades, you know, uh, of professional experience, that's helpful. It's it's also when you're starting something, you're stacking every advantage you have, and. Um, what's incredible to me is that indies, when we stack our advantages, can compete against Microsoft and Amazon and Apple and Spotify and all these other people. And that we even have any sway. This is like the whole beauty of the internet. This is the first time in history that uh, small independents have this much leverage. It's one of the reasons I'm such a, a proponent of the open internet and open protocols like HTTP, like RSS, like email, 
like these are the foundations of the internet and they're also what give us all of our leverage. It's, there's no, it's no accident that the top 10 most profitable bootstrap companies or companies that were bootstrapped, like four or five of them are in email, <laughs> you know, like open protocol, nobody owns it. And they were able to build MailChimp, ConvertKit, uh, Campaign Monitor, like it, Active Campaign. Like these were all bootstrap companies. And some of them still are, and they're massively profitable. Because, and it's always funny, like what, what Google decides to go into, you know, they've just ignored email newsletters and email marketing because they want to own the whole thing. They want, we need to keep supporting the open internet. We need to make sure it continues to exist because it is what gives independence their power. It's also the reason you're seeing a lot of creators like YouTubers, Instagrammers, they're going to old protocols now. Now they're starting podcasts on RSS. Now they're starting email newsletters, right? Now they're going back and building themselves a website because they, they know there's massive downsides to a company owning the platform. Yeah, definitely. So, like, um, I, was, I guess I was listening to the Indie Hackers podcast recently and they're interviewing Coral and just talking to two people that are on OnlyFans. And yeah, like, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of very particular use case because I gather most payment processors don't allow like adult content and stuff like that. So they're stuck yeah. with OnlyFans and OnlyFans take 20%, which is like yes. huge. And they can't do this thing where anyone, any other person in the creator economy could make a one page website and card and throw up a Stripe and take, okay, 3% or something like that. But um, yeah. yeah, they and OnlyFans seemingly is has terrible UX and doesn't bring them any users. They bring the, yes. the people to the, so that's a, kind of like an example where this breaks out. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and there needs to be more competition there. Like, uh, and there's already tons of adult content on Twitter and a lot of those OnlyFans Creators are big on Twitter already. Uh, Twitter did a really mediocre implementation of tipping. Uh, the the true implementation of of that is and Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Cash App and Square, just give uh, those adult creators give them credit card processing. Compete with OnlyFans on Twitter. Yeah. And uh, do the you know charge them three percent or. Uh, you know, so that you're, and that would be a, a massive advantage, right? Now all of a sudden people would switch. And just as an aside also, like it, to me, it's incredible. Like how many people work at Twitter? Like thousands. And their implementation of tipping is to add an icon with a link to PayPal. Yeah, I know. That's um, their implementation. Yeah. A anyone who, anyone who thinks that, um, you know, maybe, um, just learning HTML isn't real programming. Well, there you go. Massive uh, product announcement. Twitter has tipping. It's a it's a, an SVG linked to PayPal. It's yeah, a, <laughs> absolutely. The 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 mediocrity in so much of the tech world is astounding. Well, it's you know? like like today, Sam Parr from like the hustle was just saying like, what do software engineers at LinkedIn do all day? Because <laughs> they don't work on product, that's for sure. It's just like, yeah, it's true. And I mean, I'm sure it's hard once you get to that scale. But again, this is the advantage of being a one to five person company is you can just move so much faster. Um, move faster with way less hours. This is the other... Uh, myth is that every indie hacker is working 60 hour weeks it's not true Good. especially if you targeted a a category with momentum um john and i make consistent progress on the product on marketing on all those things and we don't work a ton i know that you have a family i was going to ask if you're on i guess there's kind of a spectrum between 
the like hustle, you know, work with their friends when you could be making money or calm, mm -hmm. chill out or whatever. And yeah, that's, it's cool. I mean, you've got a company so split between two of you making over a million dollars a year and you're saying you mm -hmm. work like, you know, eight hours a day kind of thing. Yeah, I usually less bail. It's, yeah. it's not to, and it, it's difficult to know, I, to add more context, because I definitely, as an indie hacker, have worked many years where I was just hustling, 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 lots and lots of hours. So what I don't know is, in order to get here, if all of those hours were necessary, because I can't split test my own life. But I do know, from my own experience, and watching friends who were successful earlier than me, who just happened into a market with momentum um, that it's the market that drives most of the growth and most of the momentum and most of your profitability. It's the wave you're riding that's going to determine a lot of those, those things. And every category has its pros and cons. And in terms of how hard you work, in terms of how stressful it is, in terms of how many people you're going to need, in terms of how much drama you're going to have to put up with on Twitter, in terms of, you know, there's all these things. Um, and I think in many ways, John and I are just really fortunate because right now, even though it could all fall apart and it could all change tomorrow, uh, we have an incredibly calm company with really good margin that have allowed us to, especially for me, having spent lots of years in the wilderness kind of hustling and you know, uh, burning lots of gas, burning lots of fuel, you know, and running on empty, it's been a nice payback for sure to have the, to have this business now. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, some days I work two hours, some days I work three hours, some days I get excited and I might put in an eight hour day. Um, I'm still thinking about business all the time. That part's hard to turn off. <laughs> uh, I'm still not like super fun to be with on weekends. <laughs> Um, but the, in terms of like calm and comparing like what it's like now compared to, I don't know, 2016 or 2017, it's night and day. It's just, uh, way more margin, way less work, way less stress. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to be stressful. And the folks I know who are in good indie businesses, um, and I'm friends with, you know, when I'm chatting with them in private, they'll say, yeah, we work like three hours a day, four hours of good focused time is like a, a plus if you get there. And again, maybe to get there, you have to hustle harder in the short term, but if that short term hustle turns into a marathon, you're probably just in a bad market Yeah. or something else is wrong. I know that one of my friends, um, Laura Lacombe. Um, mm -hmm. who does Nest Labs. She, yeah, yeah, she did a great article where she was like, it's been shown over time, you know, over history that basically you have like three or four hours of productivity a day. Like Charles Dickens wrote until midday from like eight till 12 and then just had mm -hmm. naps the rest of the day. And he's like one of the yeah. most revered, you know, authors of all time. Um, yeah. Um, but it's still, why do we have this thing for, if I went on Twitter and I said, I worked for three hours today and then I'm just taking the rest of the day off, I get crucified yeah. by people being like, oh, well, you know, good luck ever making money or <laughs> like, what, what, we just have this hustle culture, I guess. Yeah. And a lot of uh, work culture is broken, right? We're, we're still like, if you dig into history, you know, so much of our uh, work habits were developed during the Industrial Revolution where you had to be there turning that crank at the factory. And uh, the boss had a lot of leverage over you. Uh, you had very little power and uh, you were just happy to be there. Um, and if the boss could make you work 10 hours a day turning that crank, he would, right? Um, but especially information work and tech work is a different type of work, much more similar to writing and then uh, turning a crank. But we still have this expectation that's been born out of 
decades of culture and history that, yeah, you've got to be in your desk, uh, sitting at your desk for eight hours, nine hours a day. And I think the helpful part is when you realize it's bullshit, then, <laughs> then you don't care what people say. It's like, yeah, sure. We all know that m most of what happens in the office culture is waste. Like yeah. if I go to work and I put Excel, Excel on my screen and I stare at Excel all day but don't do anything, but the boss sees me staring at Excel, he thinks I've done a good day's work. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter. Yeah, definitely. I think we're going to have to wrap up there for the podcast. But um, <laughs> where can people, sorry for the abrupt ending, where can people find no. out more about you on the internet? Uh, sure. Uh, Transistor is transistor.fm. On Twitter, I'm the letter M, the letter I, Justin, M, I, Justin. And I write a newsletter at justinjackson.ca. Awesome. Well, that was super interesting to talk to you. Be sure to check out Transistor. Sound good enough for the No Stats 3 podcast. Probably good <laughs> enough for yours as well. But yeah, cheers, Justin. Yeah, thanks.